what is destroying altars? Because you may hear it, but you, you have to know what is really going on when you're destroying altars. Altars are built up by people that went before you, like uh, in your bloodline in specific. And these people lean to their own understanding to make decisions, but they were being guided by familiar, uh, familiar spirits, which are fallen angels. So they were being guided by the heaven, the the heavenly, um, the heavenly places, the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. They were being guided by those beings to sculpture what they would do in their life. So their careers, their marriages, the children they had, the decisions they made in their personal life, it was being driven by these beings. Now, I want you to see this. It doesn't mean that they never called on the name of the Lord. But even after they called on the name of the Lord, they did not adapt enough to the Holy Spirit to destroy all of the altars. So then the altars come upon you for you to destroy them. And see, you're not at a disadvantage when this happens. Because when you humble yourself before God, he gives you a multiplied grace, a higher grace, an intense grace, so that you can actually defeat the spirits they didn't defeat. Hereby also you'll recognize why the Holy Spirit at times will call you away from those very people. Because the Holy Spirit is saying, leave your father's house. Your father's house didn't defeat the altars of the father's house. So leave it so that I can sanctify you. John 17, verse 17 said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So how the Holy Spirit sanctifies you is he sanctifies you by giving you the word to sanctify yourself. But then he sanctifies you by giving you words while you're sanctified. So he, he gives you the word to sanctify you. Then he gives you new words while you're sanctified. Now, here's so amazing. What's so amazing? If you don't ever let him sanctify you, you never get the words that's in the sanctification. There were things that the Lord was talking to Abram about after he sanctified himself that he wasn't talking to Abram about before he sanctified himself. You see? So there's people that miss out on that conversation because they, they don't embrace the sanctification. They don't say, no, 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 I don't want to disconnect from that person. Now, I, I want you to see this. You can't destroy an altar until you disconnect from the people that also didn't destroy that altar. Man, this mighty. Ay, 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 ay. No, listen to what I just said right there. You can't destroy an altar until you disconnect yourself from people that also didn't destroy that altar. People be in alignment. You're, imagine you're in alignment with someone constantly that wasn't in alignment with God constantly to destroy something that God has given to you to destroy. It's like an oxymoron. So if I be honest with you, um, how the Holy Spirit set my life to go, he disconnected me from biological father because I have to destroy the altars of biological father. I have to destroy, okay? I can't destroy if I'm connected to it. If I'm connected to the empowerment, of why the altar is still in existence, 
I can't destroy that altar until I disconnect myself from the person, the people that are a part of it still remaining. So leaving your father's house is Abram even being told slowly by God, your father is the problem. <laughs> and, as long, and, and as long as you are in the entanglements, the environments, the presence of the father, you will not have any part with me because I didn't succeed with getting that father to yield to me. If you stay amongst them, neither will you. And saints, even though people try to act like it's not so, it's impossible for you to stay connected to an enemy of God and be his friend. It's impossible. It's impossible. If you have a sibling that don't serve the Lord according to the natural brother or sister, and you talk with them and chill out with them, you ain't on fire for the Holy Ghost and you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. You just like them because what fellowship does light have with darkness? I can't joke and clown around with you and you have rejected my God and my God is fully inside of me and you don't want nothing to do with him. And I say that I belong to him. How do you have something to do with me and you don't want nothing to do with him? I must be in the same kingdom of you. Yes, I, we must be serving the same God. I'm just in denial. I'll say, no, I don't serve no Satan. Yes, I do. Because me and you could still fellowship with one another. No, no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. No. We could still fellowship with one another. If you tell him me, that you are light and they are darkness. And the Bible says, what fellowship? What fellowship? It means that there's no fellowship. There's no ordained fellowship. What fellowship does light have with darkness? And you telling me that you're able to fellowship with them often. Don't tell me that you light. You are darkness just like them. It's just you're not in transparency in vocalizing that you're of darkness. You, you, you just know how to code it. You just know how to suppress it. You just know how to pit in the words that you're not darkness. But if you could locate fellowship, and you claim to be light, Is it possible? Is it possible? So oftentimes people don't destroy altars because they don't even get connected, disconnected from the person that has permitted that altar to remain. And they don't get away from the person that the altar, it was given to them to defeat it and they didn't defeat it. So imagine what can I learn from King Saul that's going to progress me? I, I can learn stuff from him that could create warning signs. And, oh, oh no, I don't want to make that same mistake. Oh, I don't want to make. Okay, now let's go past that. Because you can look at a fool and learn from a fool. But the learning is not progression. The learning is prevention. See, if you learn from a fool, it's not for progression. It's only for prevention. That's the only thing uh, you can learn from a fool. You can't learn anything from a fool that progresses you. You just learn things from a fool. You say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to end up like them. I don't want to make that foolish decision when you're the wise. So you tell me, how is it that you're going to defeat an altar while you are still in good fellowship with a person that had that same opportunity as you 
and they failed. Mm. What is the transference between you and their fellowship? Are they transferring to you the ability to succeed? Or are they transferring to you the ability to fail also? Mm. Elisha wanted his mother and father to remain in his life. Elijah came to call him away from them which means that in them is nothing that creates progression for Elisha in the will of God. You understand that the will of God is not just a plan, it is a place. It is a location that one enters where they become a student to be taught by one teacher who is the Holy Ghost. And if anybody will affect that teaching, the Holy Ghost will demand that they no longer be a part of your fellowship. The Holy Ghost will make a demand. Now he can't force it because he wants somebody that will agree with the demand. So he's not going to make it happen. You are the only one that's going to make the will of God happen in your life. Not even the God of the will. He's not going to make it happen. Which means he's not going to force it to happen. If, if somebody created to be a police officer and you decide, man, I don't like being a police officer, man. I, I rather, nah, I don't want to be no police officer. Or if you even start being a police officer and you encounter some injustices and people spit on you and you have some weird scenarios and you say, I don't want to do this no more. You can walk away from being a police officer, even though you're supposed to be a police officer, because the Holy Spirit is not going to make his will happen on you. You are the one that makes the will of God happen on you. And so there are people, you are around somebody that the will of God was hindered by them. You're not hearing me. They encountered the Holy Ghost talking to them and they said, no, I don't agree. No, I don't think that should be. No. I, I don't I, I don't think that um it should go like that. Imagine being around a person that they got to grade elementary. They got to grade one. They got to grade two, grade three, grade four, and they about to go to grade five, and then you know you graduate, go to grade six, and when they get to grade five, they say, No, it's okay. Uh, I, 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 I'd rather stay at grade four. I'll just stay at grade four. You're like, you not want to go to grade five? No, no, no. So, so watch this here. Why are they at grade four? There was levels of righteousness in grade five that was going to purge them and sanctify them and purify them and give them the advantage to destroy the altars of Satan that's in their bloodline. And you know what they do? They say, no, I don't want that. I'll stay at grade four. Let me show you something. And oftentimes we, you, you, you start off in a family that don't even go to grade four. So I'm being nice. <laughs> I'm being nice. I mean, you both know that you, you go talk to people that you call your family. You talk to them about the seed, seed time harvest. You see how they look at, look, they look at you like you, you, like you got, like you got five ears. Uh, yeah, I've heard about tithes and offerings and. Yeah, I've heard about it. <sighs> yeah. You go have an intellectual conversation with people 
according to the wisdom that you have received from God of what he loves and you listen to how they talk. You meet some people, they so crazy as hell. They'll keep on telling you that the Holy Ghost talking to them. It's like the Holy Ghost got diarrhea mouth. Like he just always talking to them. But you can see that they unrestrained. They inconsistent. They distracted. They don't focus good. They don't complete stuff. And you're like, how could somebody that acts like they hear from the Holy Ghost so much could be so disloyal, dishonorable, defeated. They could have such dyslexia. They can't even function with focus for long enough. They're not consistent. They're not faithful. I, I don't even know where they stand sometimes. Sometimes I'm trying to figure out, is they of God? Is they of the devil? Is they possessed today? Is they possessed uh, 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 tomorrow? Is this, is, is the Lord talking to them? Is they angry? Is they upset? Is they bothered? Is they sick? Do they don't feel well today? And you watch people like that and you look at them and they claim that the Holy Ghost always telling them something crazy as hell. You know, I've been walking this walk for a long time and I've noticed this, that there are, uh, there's a group of people and these people will lie on God and God doesn't kill them. Because they are what we call, um, there's a word um, that the Holy Spirit gave me. They're demoniacs. They're demoniacs. They're demoniacs. They are mentally sick, which means that they, they have rejected the authenticity of fellowship with the Holy Ghost. So now they have a lying spirit that they operate with and the Holy Ghost doesn't kill them. They'll tell you the Holy Ghost told me this, the Lord told me this, and they're lying, but the Holy Spirit doesn't kill them. He will judge them though. They will get judged. There will come a time where God and them They'll stand before the judgment seat and every lie that they were saying in his name, they will be beaten with many stripes. There will come a day. They're not getting away. But in this life, if you ever encounter somebody like this, the Holy Spirit will permit that for you to understand the world of deception. That when people don't receive their true and genuine calling in the Holy Ghost and they reject the path that the Spirit of God picks for them, they become demoniacs. They become people that have a mindset that is driven by traditions and they hear a voice talking to them, and these are the spirits that actually defeated them from doing the will of God. And these spirits didn't defeat them because the Holy Spirit wasn't enough to give them the victory. These spirits defeated them because they were unwilling to submit themselves and do what was demanded of them to destroy the altars of familiar spirits. So when familiar spirits see, oh, you have a little animosity towards God. You are offended with God's will. You are upset with how he's doing things. You don't agree with it. Those spirits know you have the portal open to us still and you were supposed to be free from us. We were supposed to have no power over your ways, your time, your body, your decisions, your relationships, your finances. And because you still have permitted us for year upon year, a new year came in and we still had a voice. A new year came in and we still had influence. A new year came in and you still gave us authority. A new year came in and we still still could convince you. We still could mentor you. We still could persuade you. We still could tell you what we wanted you to do. We still could connect you to wrong people. We still could guide your path. We still could cultivate your appetite. And they know, okay, now we're going to start talking to you in the name of the Lord. Because you are already deceived. Because if you wasn't deceived, our presence will be absent. We will be evicted from your vessel. I'm talking to you about people that lie to you. They talk to you like is the Holy Ghost talking to them in their lying. 
They'll, they'll, they'll tell you, the Lord told me. How many times in your life has somebody come up to you? Uh, they don't even, the Lord told me to tell you. And meanwhile, the Lord ain't telling them to tell you nothing. The Lord doesn't kill them. And you say, well, why don't when the Lord kill them? They're lying on him. He permits people to lie on him. And the other part of the page is that you that are encountering them. If you are not in a true place with the Lord, that liar. You will receive their words. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. You will receive what they're saying because you yourself is a wicked doer. See, you only could give heed to a liar when you yourself is false. That's why they could get away with lying to you because you yourself is underneath the same system they are underneath. Because if you're in God's system, remember the Holy Ghost, he guides you in what? Wait a minute. The Holy Ghost guides you in what? All, 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 T-R-U-T-H. All, T-R-U-T-H. All truth. So imagine, the Holy Ghost guides you in all truth. You're not being guided into the truth about them. You can't arrive at the truth about them. It's because you yourself. Is false. You only could heed a liar if you're a wicked doer. Wow. Wow. You only could heed a liar if you are a wicked doer. Wow. I, I see the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 4. It says, a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips. See, it's biblical. You see how the Holy Spirit teaching spiritual things upon spiritual? It's biblical. Proverbs 17 verse 4 says that a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips. You know what giveth heed? It means giveth time to consider. It giveth time to deliberate and be persuaded by and convince. It, it, it becomes a, a, a place of reference. You use their words as a place of GPS. Their words guide you. Their words give you the analogy of a thing. Saints, let me just say this to you. Don't overanalyze divine instructions. If I come to you and I say, I don't want you to post this statement on your page. Don't, don't, don't think in your mind, I'm just giving you an example. I haven't told none of you all that. But I'm just telling you, I haven't told you none of that recently. But I'm just telling you, I'm giving you an example. If I tell you that, don't overanalyze the instruction. Don't say, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have did that because I spelled this wrong. Or I should have had did that. Maybe he don't want me to, to post things about this specific subject. No, you overanalyzing an instruction. It ain't got beep to do with nothing that you're talking about. It's an instruction. It's an opportunity to submit yourself to wisdom. That's all. Don't try to overanalyze it. Like right now, if, if I tell you, um, don't sit next to Juan. Then in your mind, maybe he think that I want one. Maybe he think that I'm trying to replace one. Maybe he think that one is, is about to fall away from him. So he's telling me not to sit next to one because one about to serve Satan. One about to denounce the Holy Ghost and say, I, I want to I sin. I want to I feel what it's like to drink this Budweiser. You see how stupid 
You see how retarded? Now you having a conversation within yourself that ain't got nothing to do with the fact that you're having a chance to break an altar through instructions. Through instructions. It's through instructions that you destroy the altars of the devil in your life. And people don't like to be instructed. That's why they keep their altars going for generation after generation. And those are the people that they have dementia when they get old. They have diseases in their body. Bone diseases, blood diseases. They're sick. They're blind. They need a caretaker. All type of stuff go wrong with them because they never destroyed the altar. The altar is only destroyed when you are obeying an instruction from God. Proverbs 13, 18. This scripture changed my soul in the season I was in as a teenager. This changed my soul. It says poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instructions. When I heard this scripture, when I read this scripture, I was shook to the core of my soul. When I read it, I was like, ah. If people only knew this scripture, it says poverty and shame shall be to him that refuse instruction. You see people all the time talking about, I don't receive that with their broke self. With their broke self. They so poor. And when I say poor, I'm not even just talking about financially. I'm saying poor being they lacking reverence for God. Lacking the desire to please him. Lacking the knowledge that I'm not even here for me. I'm on another man's schedule. I'm on his time. I don't got these blood cells in my body working, this bones working in my body. I don't have a soul within myself. For me, I'm here for him. And it said, poverty and shame shall be to him that refuse instruction. Refusing instruction. Why do people refuse instruction? What's behind it? What is the the, the thing that goes on, the activity that goes on while people refuse instruction. Number one, the person has already pre-planned their life. You know how wicked that is? When we start off in school, you know what our teachers start to tell us? What do you want to be when you grow up? I, I experienced that when I was younger. You remember, you remember that? When we started in school, what did they ask us? What was the teachers always telling us? What When we first started out, what was they telling us? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? Imagine, they're asking you a question that it shouldn't even be in your control. You should offer this department back unto the one that gave you the privilege to manifest from the sperm cell of your dad and let you come to the earth. But they'll, they'll pit it in your jurisdiction and you see kids, I want to be a firefighter or I want to be a doctor or I want to be this and I want to be that. And already, it's already built in that it's okay for you to pick your path. Saints, let me, let me leave you with this wisdom door as well. Path decides, path decides provision. Path decides provision. The path you pick decides the provision that you have. Path decides provision. There are people that have a hard path because you're a hard-headed person. If you don't like what's happening to you on your path, change the path. If you're a lazy person, you don't work, your path is going to be hard. Let me show you something. Let me, let me show you something in the word of God. Let's go ahead to Proverbs 13, 15. 
It says, but the way of the transgressor is hard. Did, let, me, let me slow this down to you. And let me explain it to you. It says the way of the transgressor is hard. You know what that means? It's saying that when you are transgressing, do you know what transgression is? Let's, let's break that down firstly. Transgression is a decision making that you make after the truth is revealed to you. Wait, 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 wait. Let me slow this down. Let, 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 me, let me slow this down. It is a choice system that you still abide by. After the Holy Ghost has told you in clear words what he wants. Transgression means, okay, I heard that. But this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I feel is best for me. Let me tell you how loving the Holy Spirit is. He'll let you do that. He'll let you do it. Now watch. After you do it. And here's the story of everybody. After you do it. You don't like what it creates. You don't like the poverty and the shame. You don't like the feeling. You don't like the consequence. Duh. That's why he was teaching you of the path you should pick. Because he knows that when you pick this other path, the way of this path when you're transgressing against him is hard. Now, now let's deal with this word hard. When it says that the way of the transgressors is hard. Now, what does it mean when it say this word hard? It means that you will encounter things that you wasn't created to encounter. It means that you're going to experience seasons that's not even in the book of the Lord for your life originally. It means that things are going to occur around you and within you and for you that was never supposed to occur. You're going to connect with people that was never even supposed to know of you. They was never supposed to even know of you. You'll be shocked how many people you don't talk with in this life that you was never supposed to even have a word exchange with them. Saints, if I'll be honest with you, I've met preachers before. And some of these preachers, I've seen them on TV before I was 10 years old, 9 years old, 8 years old. And I've had these preachers tell me, you know, I want you to come to my church. I want us to connect. And I'll be talking with them. I'll say, yeah, well, we're looking to it. And stuff. And we talking and talking. And there are times while we talking and it look like, hey, hey, hey. But after that day, I never talk to them again. I never say hi, hello, how you doing? It's like nothing. To the degree if we meet again, it'll be like we strangers. Like, hey, how you been? Like, what, what's the... I haven't heard from you, I haven't seen you. Because that's, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to see out of my vessel. It's not for me to continue on. It's not for me to birth a door. As a matter of fact, I'm not even supposed to go and minister at their place. I'm not supposed to go and lay hands on nobody, pray for nobody. I'm not supposed to do any of those things. Now, if I'm supposed to do it, of course, I, the Holy Spirit has full authority over this body. That's what I'll do. But what he doesn't want, I don't want. And what he doesn't desire, I don't desire. 
Instructions is how you destroy the altars of the devil. That's why when people are hungry for promotion and they're hungry for provisions, they're even hungry for favor, they end up in the wrong path for their life. Because they did not even consult of the Lord. If he was with that, they just wanted to be in something that fit the narrative that they had in their mind. Here's the wicked thing in man. Here's the wicked thing in man. Man have an imagination. They have an imagination that's unrenewed, is not from God. And this imagination works within them while they're young. And here's the wild thing about this imagination. They see themselves becoming things. Women see themselves getting married to a man and having children and having a family. That's what they see. They see themselves walking down an aisle and people throwing bouquet and, you know, they, they being married and they got their husband right there. And that, that's what people see. Men, they have, they have, they have their imaginations. They have things that they imagine. They, they have an imagination. You know, I'm going to be rich, be wealthy. I'm going I'm to be able to enjoy sexual activity. Bam, bam, bam. Men have imaginations. I'll give family, bop, bop, bop. Imaginations. It is wickedness for you to plan and you're on another man's time. If you created yourself, that is okay. You are not wicked. You have all the right to choose and imagine and fantasize away, but you ain't do squat. You popped up with his body, with his soul, with his plan in a waiting stage to be performed and fulfilled in you. And you know, the more that you start to grow in your imagination, the more wicked you become. Until your heart becomes so hardened that when the Holy Ghost, if he does ever get to tell you what he wants, the Holy Ghost is speaking to a demon-possessed person. Because demons know that you have carried that imagination for years. They know it. And they know that you are dedicated to your imagination, not God. And the word of God said that in Noah's day, their imaginations of their heart was evil continuously. Wow. Which literally means that they had things in them of what they wanted their life to be. And they, every day that went by, they never got rid of those things. They actually grew in the things. And, and watch this here. Not only did they grow in the evil imaginations, meaning like it was, it was, it was um, manifesting inside of them real heavy. It was intense. It was an urge. When imagination manifests, it becomes an urge. When manifestation manifests inwardly, it becomes an urge outwardly. Then they started doing what they imagined. Remember, they wanted to build a tower, a tower that would reach up to the heavens. Remember the Holy Spirit, they want them to build that tower. But they were so groomed and they grew that desire. They grew that imagination. They saw themselves. They meditated on it. They thought about it. They had outer body experiences visualizing themselves with this tower of Babel. And demons had gotten involved with them to help them perform it. And you know what God said? Let us go down and confuse their language. Because that which they have imagined, they will do it. And that's what people do with their life. They imagine having a family. They go force it. 
with a nigga that don't even love you. They go force it. You with a man that don't even know God. That man don't even know his angels. And you up there arguing with God why he don't know you. She. <laughs> you tripping, tripping. You up there talking about how he don't know me. I'm supposed to be his woman and he don't know who I am. He don't even know the God that gave him sperm cells and bones and marrow. He don't even know the God that is breathing oxygen inside of him. And you shock. And then here's another thing. People come into this life and all of a sudden they start developing. Oh, this is my love language. This your love language. It's your love language. How did you get a love language? And let's break this down. Love language. Love literally means God. It means Jesus. So you're telling me that you have a language from Jesus of how people should deal with you. And you don't even know Jesus's language or how you should deal with him. You got a love language. You got a love. How you get your love language? You haven't even learned of him. And here you on earth talking about people should learn of you. Oh, this is my love language. I, I'm, I'm the touchy type. This is my love language. I like to kiss. I, this is my love language. I like to cuddle. This is my love language. You got a love language. How you get a love language and you don't even know love himself. Oh, this is my love language. I am, I am, I am the communicating type. I like to communicate. I, I, this is my love language. I like compliments. I like when people compliment me. Uh, this is my love language. I love, a love language. How you get a love language? You don't even know love himself and you got such a love language that satan who rejected love is building up inside of you to the degree satan places it in that same department of imagination that you build for your life so the lord will come into your life and even go against that love language. Your love language is somebody talking mild and meek to you. And the Lord will come into your life and call you a brood of vipers. The Lord will come into your life and tell you, you generation of serpents. Ha. Ah. The Lord will come into your life and turn over the tables where you're selling merchandise. And he say, my, my house shall not be a house of, 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 of this selling, this merchandise. It shall be a house of prayer. And now Satan says, red flags. This person goes against your love language. So you know it's not God. You said that your love language is communication. And here, this person comes into your life. They saying that they're of the Lord and they're sent by the Lord. And here, they don't even want to communicate nothing to you. You're trying to feel, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to know that. I'm supposed to know. And then people become offended. Meanwhile, the root of the love language was the same individual that rejected love. And this same individual sculptured a love language inside of you so that when you meet love, you will critique the love and say, this is not love. You don't love me because you chasten me. You don't love me because you tell me the truth. You don't love me because I don't feel happy when you tell me about myself. I don't feel good when you just 
brought to my attention that I missed the mark. I don't feel good when you just looked at me and you cut your eye at me to signal to me that you didn't approve of how I just spoke or how I just acted. And watch this here. Now we got people that start to lean over to their love language and say, no, 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 I'm getting out of here because my love language is not being performed, which you didn't even catch. This is the same Luciferian reaction. Lucifer was created by God and Lucifer created a standard within Lucifer's self that said, I want this. I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will make myself like the most high. I, I, and Lucifer was created. So how could you have all these expectations and you didn't even create yourself? How could you roadmap your life and you didn't even create yourself? How could you say what you're going to do and what you're going to become and you didn't even create yourself? How could you look upon your days on earth and start making schedules and itineraries and you didn't even create yourself? You don't even understand that you're underneath the influence of the same being that is leading the world to hell, the same being that is deceiving people to curse God and die, and you start taking on that same demeanor, and you start becoming so bold and intentional. I'm not going to let nobody go against my standards. I'm not going to let nobody go against my love language. If they come up against my love language or I'm pinning up the cross, if they come up against my expectations of how my life, I saw myself doing this. You saw yourself doing this. You could see yourself doing it when you create yourself. Go kill yourself right now and go see if you could build up yourself while you're in eternity. You'll find out, oh, eternity is not even a place where I am in control. God is in control. I can't choose to go to heaven. He got to let me in. He got an angel standing. Did you know right now? Say, 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 um, say you died and uh, you, you went to the gates of heaven. Do you know that there's a heaven? There's an angel there, a tall angel with the book. If your name is not written down in the Lamb Book of Life, you can't proceed. If your name is not written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, you can't proceed. They won't let you into the gate. Did you know that? God is such a person of order that if your name not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that angel will not let you proceed. That angel at the gate. Now watch this. When you stand at the gate, you'll be able to see the glory. You'll, you'll see there's big old cities. There's a whole world up there. You'll see glimpses of it. But you have to go inside of the gate and be taken to the neighborhood of God. There's the neighborhood of the prophets. When you go there, you'll see all type of prophets. You'll see um, hey guy. You'll see Ezekiel. Ezekiel still got his long hair. Ezekiel got locks. You'll be shocked. Ezekiel got locks. He got long hair. You'll be shocked. The neighborhood of the prophets are different and it's very elegant. They have big old, big old palaces that it would take you days to even take the measurement. But see, that's only in the cities of heaven. In paradise, they rule their own cities and they rule over nations. And when you say nations, you like, what, what you mean by that? They rule over people. And who are the people that they rule over? It's people that they were assigned to on earth. These, these people make it to heaven. Your prophet will always be your prophet. Your prophet is an eternal representative of Jesus to you. 
That's the only Jesus you could see in perfection. You'll meet people that will represent Jesus. They'll open up a door for you, a workplace. They'll give you a ride to work. They'll, they'll represent Jesus in different facets. But your prophet is Jesus unloaded, unlimited, constantly being unfolded to you. You study your prophet, you have the advantage on how Jesus is as a person. You study your prophet, you'll understand how Jesus carries himself. Jesus possesses the prophet and Jesus picks a path for the prophet that will be offensive to you if you really don't want him. You, you say, what you mean by that? Jesus has a eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Saints, do you know drink of my blood could be many things? Eat of my flesh could be many things. But there's an eat of my flesh, drink of my blood realm that if you truly don't love, you cannot make it. And that's how God brings to the forefront everybody's heart because God looks and says, oh, so you rather stick to your expectation of godliness rather than godliness revealed to you. You rather stick to your expectation of holiness rather than holiness being unfolded to you. You rather stick to your expectation of life in good success rather than life in good success being explained to you and displayed to you and demonstrated to you. And that's what people are doing. The man that walked away from Jesus, Jesus went against his expectation. And he picked his expectation over the eternal life that he said that he wanted, which was all a fraud. See, if you're going to make it in this life, you're going to have to leave every expectation that you have built up when you were in the flesh, when you was not submitted to God, you wasn't surrendered to God. You made all these expectations. Let me tell you something that happened with older women, too, as you get older. Say you're an older woman, you ain't got no children. You know what Satan start doing? Satan start putting pressure on you. You ain't got no children. You ain't never been married. You ain't got no child. You ain't got this. That's what Satan come oppress you. If you ain't destroy the altars of the devil. That happened a lot with women as they get older. You get older, you're not having no, you, you get older, you're not having no sex. I remember when I turned 18 years old, I remember there was this man, he came to me and told me, he said, you just turned 18. You're not having no sex. He said, you, 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 you legal now. You can drink, you can do all this. This is what the man was telling me. He said, you you, you you should enjoy your youth. Don't be taking care of no mama and doing all this stuff. Enjoy yourself. Take care of your, 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 your youth and have fun. And they was telling me, oh, when I was younger, I had fun. And I, I, I was like, I, I, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hendricks. Um, I just got a call on my Obama phone. Back then it was... <laughs> my Obama phone, my Obama phone, I had to get it from food stamps. My Obama phone, somebody called me on my my minutes Obama phone. I, I, I answer my Obama phone to see what they're saying. These are, Mr. Hendricks, you want Pops. He was spewing all that venom. And it's funny, I didn't have that expectation on myself. So Satan sent somebody to give it to me. I hope you hear what I'm saying. Satan is such a false god of imagination that Satan, if Satan sees that you got your mind on lock, you're not disrespecting God with the knowledge of I am here for myself. I'm going to fulfill what I see myself doing. When Satan sees that you're not on the bed, Satan will send somebody to introduce it to you. I, I, I know that you're not making expectation for your life. I know that you're not planning to transgress against the Lord, to trespass against the Lord. So I'm going to send somebody of my kingdom to converse with you. 
so that they could talk to you about this realm because I don't see you actively entertaining it. I don't see you disrespecting the Lord. I don't see that your heart is proud. So you need somebody to come and recruit you into this world. That's why the Bible said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to the world, which means do not let the mentor that causes imaginations to be in you. You see yourself being a certain way, doing a certain thing, living out a certain pathway. Don't let that enter in you. And when Satan sees that you, you don't let it enter into you, Satan says, I need to talk to somebody that I still have expectations in them that are not from God's book for their life. They still want to have the baby and God don't want them to have no baby. They still want to have a husband and wife and God ain't saying I'll give you a husband and wife. You're not going to be waking up with your funky breath, breathing all that dinosaur breath into Mr. Frederick, Mrs. Guatemala. You're not going to be breathing all of that guacamole tonsils into Mr. Felipe. Peter did not see Jesus dying on the cross. And notice what Jesus said. You don't savor the things that be of God, but of man. See, the things that are of man are things that Satan tells you, you as a individual with a life, you should pit an expectation since you have this life. Rob it from God. Tell it what it should do. Tell it what it should become. See, when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, let's go deep into this. Why? Was Peter even letting this come out of his heart? Which means that he never imagined Jesus dying on the cross and laying down his life and suffering crucifixion. Which shows you that Peter's heart was not in the book of God. Whoa. Peter's heart was not in the book of life. It was in the gates of hell. This mighty. This is mighty. Just think about this. So Peter has things inside of him that just like the world, he's taken his life. He's taken Jesus and he's even he's sent by the devil to introduce Jesus into making expectations for Jesus himself. That's apart from the father's will. You see how I was just talking to you. When I turned 18 years old, I told you about that man. The same way Peter got right access to Jesus. And Peter is telling Jesus, let me recruit you on how we deal with life in the world. We don't let ourselves go against the expectations we make for ourselves. This is an expectation you should make for yourself, Jesus. You, do, you shouldn't receive the plan that the Father sent you to fulfill. You should become like us, men. We take our life in oxygen. And we rob God of the reason why he gave it to us. We look at our eggs in our body and we say, if I have eggs, I should be pregnant. If I have sperm, I should have sons. If, if, I, if I have a body, I should be married. If, if I have a body, I should be able to do this and say this. And that's how we operate. We don't drink cups that we don't want to drink. We don't lay down our life. We keep it up. We, we don't lose our life. We keep it active. We make sure that we are constantly fulfilling our feelings, completing our desires, accomplishing our fantasies. 
We get it done. We don't restrain ourselves. If we want to say it, we speak it. If we want to think it, we end up doing it. We meditate on it. We accomplish every intention and motive that we have inside of us. And Jesus told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things of God. You savor the things of man. Are you somebody that savor the things of man? And that's why you'll end up falling constantly into the traps of the devil. You'll end up constantly falling into iniquity. Remember I told you iniquity is inside the heart. Nobody can see your iniquity until you perform it and it becomes sin. I want to slow this down. Nobody can see your iniquity until you perform it and it becomes documented sin. Iniquity is inward. Murderers operate in iniquity. Rapists operate in iniquity. Those are the more obvious uh, cases. But iniquity is heart planning. It's secretive. It's what you have in your heart. The Lord said, I don't want you to move to Hawaii, but you done made all of your heart dream about Hawaii. So you still planning to go to Hawaii. The Lord said, I don't want you to go on that cruise, but you in your heart still done made so much imagination about the cruise. Your heart is planning. It's heart planning. Your heart is planning to go on the cruise. That's what iniquity is. That's why God hates iniquity because iniquity, it, it links you to stubbornness. And every time a person is in iniquity, they are also a very stubborn person. They're, they're, oh my goodness. I, I, I want to read this. I want to read this to you because this is mighty. Let's read this. I, 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 I want to show you something, what the Bible says. I want to leave you with this before I get off of here. I, I want to show you this and let's get out of here. Word of God was talking about... Um, was talking about the fool and the wise. Now I want to show you this. I want to show you this. We in the book of Proverbs. Look what it says right here, Proverbs 17, 10. Look at this over here. It says, a reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. You know, you, 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 you're not catching that. You know what stripes is? When somebody lashing you and whipping you. That's why the Bible says, with his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes. Is somebody whipping you. Your skin getting ripped off your body. You going through torture. Listen. Watch this here. Proverbs 17.10. Says that a reproof. What is a reproof? A rebuke. What is a rebuke? God. He's confronting you. Because you're choosing your expectation over his. The Bible said to whom much is given. Much is required. So you are living out your requirement rather than God's. Look what it says. It says, a reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. It's telling you that when somebody is a fool, even when God rebukes them, even if it's like a hundred stripes, their heart is so loyal to their expectation that they're not going to let it go.